Hello and welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast brought to you by loserpool.com. It's a fantastic new betting game. Head over there for more information. Get involved and you can win some excellent cash prizes. Now, this is episode 52 and joining me in the man cave this evening is Mike Stavery. Mike, welcome back. Thank you very much, Harry. The man cave is sensational. I mean, I want one for my own house. I'm not even married yet, but I know that when I am, I'm going to need a space to just come away from the missus. And, uh, it's honestly, in, in the flesh, it's much better than how you describe it to me. I'll tell you what, the man cave is a marriage saver, honestly. <laughs> it really is. It really is. Right, on this week's show, we're going to be talking all things Arsenal versus Southampton. A victory uh, in the Premier League for Unai Emery's men. We'll be reflecting on the Europa League draw and we'll be talking about much more uh, Arsenal-related stuff. With me in the building, as I've already mentioned, is Mike Stavery, for those of you listening on the audio. And later on, we'll be hearing from former Arsenal midfielder David Hillier and the chief sports writer over at The Independent, Jonathan Liu. So action-packed show this week. Uh, Like I said, if you are listening on the audio, welcome. If you're listening or watching via YouTube, welcome too. And if you are on YouTube, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button. That's really, really important to us. And if you really don't want to miss anything, you can hit that little notification bell. uh, And that way you'll never miss a thing. So 2-0 victory at home to Southampton. It was a really nice day on Sunday. Great day for football. Um, Mike, the performance was a lot more fluid, wasn't it? What did you make of Unai Emery's initial team selection? Because for me, I'll be honest, when I first saw it, I was a bit like, why are you tinkering with it again? What, what did you make of it? Oba out, Ozil out, uh, Mickey Ramsey sort of supporting the striker. What did you make of the selection? Uh, I thought it was fine, to be honest with you. I mean, I was expecting Ozil not to start considering that he'd played uh, in, in midweek and he hasn't played for such a long time and he played 90 minutes. I wouldn't expect him to come and, uh, and play again. But um, I, I, was, I was fine with it. In terms of Aubameyang, we've got a lot of important games coming up, Harry. Uh, obviously, Spurs next weekend. Um, I think we need to rest and rotate the squad. I'm happy, for one, that we've gone back into a four-back. It was a 4 2 three, one I just think it suits us much more. And I think we had a lot more of our zip about us um, the football was more fluid, as you said, and uh, um, it's good because recently, let's be honest, the football's been terrible. It's been dire to watch, it's hasn't been, it? It's been terrible. Honest, so the, the fact that we're seeing, you know, some more of the football that we played early in the season when we're on that good uh, 22 game unbeaten run, I, I'm happy. I thought it was a professional performance. We got the three points and, you know, a lot of people are kind of saying, you know, you need to really perform as long as you win, that's all that matters, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, and the performance in the first half was was very good, I thought. Probably one of our best of the season in terms of the way we were creating, the way we were moving the ball with zip. The second half, we did drop off a little bit, but that's understandable. It's game management, isn't it? Yeah. And that's something that we used to criticise Arsene Wenger for not doing. Yeah. But the team did drop off a little bit in the second half, I thought. Um, Henry Mkhitaryan on the right-hand side, I thought, was, was fantastic on, on Sunday. Probably... If you look over the entire 90 minutes, he was probably, well, for as long as he was on the pitch, he was probably the best uh, the best performer on the day. What does Mkhitaryan give to this Arsenal side that maybe uh, Iwobi doesn't or, or or the reason that Ozil gets left out for him? What, what is it? Is it just hard work? or? Um, I'm happy with Mkhitaryan at the moment, but Harry, he is and always has been a streaky player. Uh, even when he was at Borussia Dortmund, he would have a few good games and then he would go missing. I think he's very much a confidence player. So the fact that he's come into this team now, had a had a good game, you know, the fans got behind him. Because I remember early in the season when he wasn't performing, the fans were getting, were turning on him really. And I think the fact that he's had a few good games, he's managed to perform. What I think he adds, he's he's clinical and he's decisive. Uh, it won't be, I think sometimes he can carry the ball too far. He doesn't know when to release it. Um, he will dribble in the wrong instance when he should pass. And I think Mkhitaryan is just that little bit older. He's played at a high level. Don't forget Dortmund, when he was playing there, were winning titles. Uh, they were in the Champions League constantly into knockout rounds. So I think that's what he adds. I think he's just very much a confidence player. So we can expect to see him have a few games and then maybe not so good the next few yeah. games after that. Yeah, I agree with, agree with that. And I think he... He's a lot more industrious than I imagined when we signed him. And I don't know if that's me having a lack of knowledge 
of maybe his time in, in Germany and, of course, his time at Manchester United. But I always thought that Mkhitaryan was a flair player, a number 10, a bit like a Mr. Ozil. And when we signed him, I couldn't really understand what the logic was behind that. Uh, I still, to this day, think that it was a panic buy because of what was happening with Alexis Sanchez. I feel like Arsenal felt they needed to get something the other way uh, to silence the critics and stuff. But he's a lot more industrious, as I said. I think he works very hard. Um, he's built up some good partnerships on the, on the right-hand side in particular. And he embodies, doesn't he, what Unai Emery wants to do. He presses from the front uh, and he's, he's he's a busy body. And I think Alex Lacazette, you could say the same thing. And that's where he, he probably improved this season. Now, there is an argument that Arsenal are more fluid and more comfortable with when we don't play Lacazette and Aubameyang. It feels like at times we're trying to shoehorn them both into the side and that's affecting the balance. What's your view on that? Would you like to see them start together every week or do you think this weekend kind of proved that maybe Emery was right at the beginning of the season when he was only picking one? Uh, I think we have to take it into context, Harry, that it's Southampton. Uh, they play Nathan Redmond as a number nine. They had no ambition of coming to us and, and, and playing football in the first half anyway. Second half, they improved, but I think that's because we uh, took our foot off the gas. We were 2-0 up already. Um, I think you're right. I think in terms of fluidity, he makes us play much better because his all-round play is fantastic. You know, I think his technical play, when you play the ball into him, hold-up play, all of that is better than Aubameyang. And the fact that he is a better number nine means that Aubameyang automatically has to be pushed into a wider role. I know some people are saying it's more of an inside forward, but I still think you're right, you're shoehorning them in. You can't really leave Aubameyang out just because how good of a player he is. I'd like to see us experiment with maybe a different system, more um, of a of a 4-1-2-1-2 or something like that, so with a narrow formation when you can fit two strikers in. Um, but I think it just really needs to be tailored uh, to every opponent because you're not going to play the same way against every team. So some some games when you want to play on the counter attack, uh, when you're playing against a bigger team, I think Aubameyang has to play. When you're playing against a team where you can have a lot of possession, I think Lacazette's just slightly better because his link up play is better. So I think yeah, Harry, you have to mix it up. But I think as an actual number nine in terms of what they have to do, not just goal scoring but getting involved in the play, Lacazette is probably better in that sense. Right. right. Another player who impressed most at the weekend was Granit Xhaka. Um, um, I've been banging on for weeks now about how I felt that the decision by, by Emery uh, a few months back to break up the partnership between Xhaka and Torreira was a poor one. Um, I think that Xhaka gets the best out of Torreira and Torreira gets the best out of Xhaka. Um, I know, Mike, that you're not a huge fan of Granit Xhaka's, uh, but would you agree with that? Do you think that that pairing gives us the best balance? Yeah, that partnership, Harry, I think is probably the best. I mean, the kind of main difference we're seeing here is the fact that we're in a different system. I think in at times where we were playing with three in the middle, with Torreira, Xhaka and Guendouzi, I just thought that was just way too negative because there's no real creative midfielders in that in that system. But the fact that when you play the two in a 4-2-3-1 of Xhaka and Torreira, they complement each other so well. The fact that Torreira is there and he cleans up all the mess means that Xhaka has got creative freedom and license to go forward. And I think that's really where we see the best of him because, as we know, he's not really a defensive midfielder. He's more of a... I don't know. He's just Xhaka, isn't yeah, he? It, it's it's yeah. hard to pin down what he actually is because I'm, I'm not sure he knows. That's right. I think he's got his own position. And, yeah. you know, a lot of people have been highly critical of Granit Xhaka this season. And you're rightly so. You know, he does make mistakes. He made a, a horrible mistake on Sunday where he passed the ball straight to a Southampton player who volleyed just wide of the goal. And I mean, on another, another day, you get punished for that and then people are talking about it. But I think it's important to, to recognise how much of an influence he had in the rest of the game, Granit Xhaka. 97% passing accuracy at the weekend, which is impressive uh, for anyone. So that's worth a mention. Now, um, another player that I want to talk about is Socrates and his influence on this side when we first signed him, you all know from the shows that we've done on Love Sport Radio that I've never been overly convinced by him. When we first bought him, I felt like we were shopping in the second bracket of players. Didn't feel like a good signing to me, but he has helped this defence out a lot, in my opinion. And it got, I'd hate to think where they would be if the, he wasn't in it because it's been a shambles other than him. But 
you know, his his ability to organise, his the way he encourages players, the way he pulls players in around him, I think is great. How would you assess his impact at Arsenal since he arrived from Dortmund in the summer? Do you know what I'd say? I'd say it's that Greek leadership quality, Harry. As as we know as Greeks, I just think he has that with it. He's a he's a leader. He really is a sort of captain type, isn't he? I think he he should have, or maybe he might be named as one of Emery's five captains at ne- next season, just because of the influence he's had. In terms of him as a defender, I think he's decent. I think he's okay in, in one on ones. I think his biggest asset is his dominance in the air, and he fights for everything. Um, but it it does show when he's in the team how much better we are because we're more organised because he does have that leadership quality, and. Um, whether he can improve Mustafi, I, I don't know. I think Mustafi is beyond help. But in terms of Socrates as himself, I think he makes us much better. I think in terms of our defence, look, there's, we know there's a lot of issues that come down from organisation as a whole. Players knowing where to be at what particular sequence, who to mark on corners, um, which we actually have have been better at this season. I think you'd probably agree with that as well. But um, did you see in the first 10 minutes, I think it was, against Southampton, Mustafi, there was a ball played over the top and he had no no clue. No clue. I think Socrates sort of helps out with that, but you can't, in terms of that, that's an individual error. That's just someone not being in sync with the with the quality of the game. But I think Socrates, he has improved our defence, but um, when we do go out and sign another defender with our £50 million pound budget this, this <laughs> summer, <laughs> um, I think we need someone to partner him because Koscielny's ageing. Um, Mustafi's not good enough I think Harry and um, Rob Holding's out for a while who knows what he's going to be like when he's back from injury what, one player I would like to see more of is uh, it, is Mavropanos because Mavropanos and Socrates you know two Greeks at the back I think that, that could be a good partnership if he gets more time but obviously he's not been playing recently so let's yeah. see what happens with that absolutely I mean the thing I always say about Mavropanos and I, I've had this debate quite a lot with people in the last few weeks is that you know being from a Greek background like we are, nothing would make me more proud than to see two centre-halves, two Greek centre-halves playing at Arsenal. But you've got to be realistic and you've got to look at Mavropanos and say, has he got potential? Probably yes. If he didn't, I don't think that he would have been brought to the club. He's obviously done something to get on the radar, but he played that game at Manchester United last season, which he played pretty well in. And then the, the last game he played and I think that was only the second senior game he played, was away at Leicester, a game that I went up to. And he got sent off, um, I think it was in the first half, and he wasn't all that, if that makes sense. And I feel like PP kind of, in the desperation, because our defence is so bad, they turn into this young boy in hope that he can solve the problems. But in actual fact... What has he shown? What has he given us to suggest that he could fill that We did that, that with, with Holding, though, didn't we? U- ultimately, we were just had no players available and Holding came in and it, initially people were kind of questioning whether he was good enough. But after a string of really good performances at the beginning of this season before he got injured, he became probably one of our best centre-backs. So I think Mavropanos is, is not easy to judge him because he's not played. I just think if he had a bit more of a run in the side... Um, we we have to see what what he's about more. So I've, I think it's difficult to judge him, but he's he's one for the future. Yeah, anyway. absolutely. Uh, my only worry with those two would be the lack of technical ability, because I think that Socrates lacks. I, I'm not going to say he's bad in possession because he doesn't really give the ball away much, but he doesn't strike me as the type of centre back that can get the ball in a tight space and do what's necessary to get out of those situations. And yeah. I don't think Mavropanos is that type of player either. So. Maybe for a manager who's so insistent on playing out from the back, that might be why he's reluctant to do it, maybe. Yeah, no, I I probably agree with you. They're both kind of big, traditional centre-halves, aren't they? They're not really your fancy types. So I do get what, what you're trying to say. Um, and it will be interesting to see what happens, really, because, uh, as I said, Koscielny's ageing. I, I don't know if he'll, he'll still be there next season. It'll be interesting to see what the kind of um, transfer policy will be in the summer because if you look at it on face value yes we're good going forward we could do with another winger sure but where the team really need really improvement is at centre back so who goes in who goes out I just wanted to ask you Harry if we throw any names into that hat in terms of centre backs because if we really do have a £50 million pound budget we're going to be shopping in the likes of Aldi rather than MS and Waitrose aren't we? Absolutely and not that there's anything wrong with shopping in Aldi by the way I do it myself but anyway Yeah Aldi's pretty good actually <laughs> the new one's yeah. open where I live <laughs> But 
when you're talking about t transfer targets, it's really difficult. It's really difficult to identify realistic targets without knowing what the actual financial situation is at the club. Um, I watch a lot of Serie A, as you know, and, and there are lots of very decent centre-backs out there. I mean, there's one at AC Milan that catches people's eye and his name's Alessio Romagnoli. He was linked with Chelsea, I think, uh, last season, but he's got injury problems. He's not been able to stay fit for a long period of time and I guess his career's kind of stagnated as a result of that, but he's someone with talent. So I guess the point I'm trying to make is there are lots of players out there if you look hard enough, if you know where to look. And the whole idea of this revolution was that it was going to be based on Sven Mislintat's ability to go out and find those players and now he's gone. So you're kind of left in a situation now where we're struggling to see what direction the club are trying to go in. There's lots of talk about Monchi now, isn't there, coming in. Um, he's got a good relationship with Unai Emery. They've got previous there. Uh, but there's a reason that Monchi is looking to get out of Roma. Things haven't gone great there um, this season. So, uh, I mean, I don't know what you think about that, the prospect of Monchi coming in. Yeah, I personally would like to see him come in. I think he's brought in a lot of good young players um, at at Roma Harry, especially uh, Cengiz Unda, who's fantastic, fantastic a young player. talent. Obviously, they recruited, they managed to get um, Justin Clivert as well uh, from Ajax. So they have brought in a lot of good young players. It hasn't really worked out for them, let, let's be honest, um, in Europe as well. But we'll let, let's not forget, I think it was last season, or the se I think it was last season, they got to the semi-finals, the, the Champions League. Yep. So they've they've not been they've not been a bad side whatsoever. The fact that he has does have a relationship with um, with Emery already from the time at Sevilla speaks good, and um, I think the quicker we can get get a technical director in, the better. Just so he can come in and outlay his philosophy. Because if we get him in in the summer, look, will he have enough time? Will he be given you know, like the the backing to to do what he wants to do? Because ultimately, look, football fans they're so reactive, and if we got a new technical director who's who's a, a big name i just think and he doesn't necessarily bring in the kind of players that we want or we as fans want the big names i think a lot of people will kind of jump on that because everyone wants a name to, to blame don't they like with um with, with emery recently he's been getting a, a lot of stick and some of some of it his fault some not necessarily i think if we have to pin our blame on anyone it has to be stan stan Kroenke. And I think sometimes fans get caught up a little bit in it's it's a blame game, isn't it? Sometimes you know clubs change and they're not exactly what they used to be. I think Arsenal were just a a change in environment, and fans need to accept that at some point. We're not going to be spending money like Liverpool or Man City. We need to adapt our philosophy um, of bringing in younger players for less, like someone like Matteo Guendouzi. That's the kind of way I think Arsenal should be going because you can still compete. Like I don't want to draw comparisons to to the scum, but I will, <laughs> in in terms of the the way that they've hardly spent any money and they haven't signed a play in the last two transfer windows and they're still ten points ahead of us. I mean, if, if it, it can be done, it can be done. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And we we digressed a little bit onto Monchi. We were talking about centre backs initially, weren't we? And so I want to ask you about Shkodran Mustafi now. For me, and this was kind of something that got me thinking at the weekend and. I know it's been spoken about in the past, but I'd never really thought a bit of it, sorry, as a serious conversation until Sunday. And that was when uh, uh, Stefan Lichtsteiner was taken off and Laurent Koscielny came on. Mustafi moved to right back. Now, we know he's played there for Germany before. And a lot of people are, are writing off Shkodran Mustafi saying he doesn't have a future at this football club. He's simply not good enough. If you look at Mustafi's strengths, in my opinion, it's that he's quite sharp. It's that he's quite comfortable in possession. Um, is there an argument that Shkodran Mustafi could be converted to a right back? Maybe not first choice, not ahead of Hector Bellerin, but maybe he's a good option to cover for Hector Bellerin and a better option than an Ainsley Maitland-Niles or an ageing Stefan Lichsteiner. In one answer, no. Um, I don't think it's the kind of fullback that you want to be going for the, the way that we play the way that Emery likes to play because on on one on one side one of our most successful players this season Harry has been Ser Kolasinac and the reason for that is because of his ability to bomb forward and help out and overlap and his delivery has been good he's a strong player defensively you know there are questions about him but for me the modern fullback is about attacking and I, although Mustafi is good on the ball 
that's a, as a centre back. As a full back, it's a totally di- different game. You need to have good, um, good dribbling. You need to be fast, which Mustafi is not. And I just don't think he has the credentials. I mean, is he better than Lazy Mate Niles? It's tough to say. Going forward, no. Defensively, maybe. But um, there's been links recently to uh, Aaron Wan Bazaka. I know. But Crystal Palace want 40 million, so that'll be 40 million of our 50 million budget <laughs> with 10 million left to spend on the rest of the team. But I think he'd be perfect for, for us. Um, whether he'd, he'd, he'd be battling with Bellerin, I think that's probably what Bellerin needs because I think he improved the most when, when there was a bit of pressure on him and, you know, Lichstein came in, not necessarily challenging him, but there was someone behind him because yeah. you have to admit there's been a lot of years when there's been no one, it's just Bellerin. Um, so, yeah, I think that would be a fantastic signing, but Mustafi, no, I'm sorry, I can't. Would, would you not say, though, that you, you said that, say, Kalasinac's biggest problem was probably his defensive, um, what's the way of putting this politely, inability, maybe? Kalasinac is often exposed defensively. There's no doubt about that. But would the system not have more flexibility with a Mustafi at right back? Because when Kalasinac does bomb forward, the defence could shift over into a back three. And then you could still have Kalasinac bombing forward with that extra insurance policy that Shkodran Mustafi on the other side can slot in and the whole defence can shift over. And you've kind of gone from playing with a back four to a back three in minutes. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd agree with you on that front, but that that basically says that all your attacking is coming from the left-hand side. What happens if you want to switch the play? Like, Mustafi's inability to go forward is going to be an issue. It makes us kind of one-sided. Ultimately, you want a player, you want two full-backs that are going to be able to do one or the other. So when the right-back goes, the left-back drops back. When the left-back goes, the right-back drops back. I think just Mustafi just leaves us short. Yeah. It's a, it's, it's a nice idea, but I'm sorry, I, just, I, I can't get behind it. I just don't think he's, I don't think he's good enough. Um, yeah, I know everyone says that he's a, he's an experienced international fair play, but so was Per Mertesacker, and not necessarily one of our best defenders over the years. So you know, it's, okay. it's, it's, it's a difficult one to say, and I, I understand, and I think, I think Ainsley Mate Niles has been, kind of. I think it's been difficult for him, isn't it? Because he's he is a midfielder by trade, and the fact that he's been slot in as a right back, and he's been slated, isn't he, by some fans, Harry? I remember especially in the Spur- in the League Cup game against Spurs, he was ripped to shreds. But you know he's not a right back, so give him time and let him actually play in his proper position before we start to judge him. Yeah, I mean, you put square pegs in round holes and, and that's bound to happen, isn't it? Um, well, let, let us know what you guys think. Does Mustafi have a chance of rejuvenating his career if he's moved to right back? Let us know, let us know what you think. Tweet us at chronicles underscore AFC or if you prefer a good old-fashioned email, you can email us chroniclesafc at gmail.com. Um, we've spoken a little bit about Stefan Licksteiner already. I thought that was one of, one of better performances in an Arsenal shirt. I thought he... Looked a lot more comfortable defensively. Didn't really get exposed. I think anything dangerous that came from Southampton in the first half came on that the, that opposite side. I thought he got forward well. I thought he used the ball well when he got forward on Sunday. Um, and I would go as far as saying that was Stefan Licksteiner's best performance in an Arsenal shirt so far. Um, he's a player who's taken pelters, hasn't he, from all angles this season. He's not been good enough, let's be realistic. But that was a good performance, and so credit where it's due. Um, Again, let us know what you think on that. Tweet us at Chronicles underscore AFC. Mike, now, as we mentioned at the top of the show, it's been a while since you've been on, actually, hasn't it? It's been a good few weeks now. Um, Obviously, this whole Mesa Ozil versus Unai Emery thing has rumbled on. It's intensified. Where do you stand on it? I've not heard from you on this. Um, let our listeners know where you stand on this whole debate and, and how you see it. To be honest, Harry, I think a lot of the blame lies with, with Emery in this one because I just think that when you have that that kind of player that's so creative, he, he's a visionary, right? 
and I think he's been s- too stubborn because th- there has been times, as I was saying earlier, when we we play a three the back formation with three defensive midfielders. Ultimately, Torreira, Jack, and Guendouzi. There's so much space for an Özil. Um, it showed in, against Barte. He he came on, didn't necessarily have his best game, but it's the touches and the anticipation and seeing things that other people don't. And the fact that um Emery's so stubborn, stick to his philosophy because he doesn't necessarily play with a number 10. I just think in every single team, you have to have a luxury player because ultimately that's the difference. That That's the game changer. And have players like Iwobi, like Mkhitaryan, who are attacking players, but they, they work hard. And yeah, fine, like they're, they're good, but they won't make a difference in, in a big game. They, they They just won't. So the fact that that he's left him out I think it's just been ridiculous and I'm I'm happy he's finally you know, swallowed his pride you know maybe Ozil isn't the best trainer like maybe he's on an obscene amount of money right um, but I just think for Emery not to play him was a bit ridiculous at, at the beginning of the season I did say to you you know I do kind of um, say well done to Emery for being so strong but I just think once that goes on for such a long time, it does become stubborn. And I'm glad, as an Arsenal fan, to see Ozil back in the team. Yeah, and he returned to Sydney for the Barte Borisov game uh, last Thursday and, and helped us in uh, securing our place in the next round. A next round, which incidentally we've been drawn against Ren uh, of France or Stade René, depending on uh, how you want to pronounce it now. Uh, decided to do a little bit of digging into Ren today uh, ahead of this show. Not a club I know a great deal about, uh, admittedly. So uh, had a little look and they are ninth in league earn at the moment. Finished fifth last season, hence they're in the Europa League. They were founded actually back in 1901. Very old historical club uh, in, in the French game. Uh, known as Le Rouge et Noir, which means between the red and blacks. And you can tell a lot of thought went into that nickname, didn't it? Um so, yeah, uh, they're managed by Julian Stefan, um, again, a manager that I don't know a great deal about. So he's someone to look into. Uh, and the stadium is called Roseanne Park. And there's a capacity there just shy of 30,000. If you look at some of their academy products over the years, uh, you know, there are some big names there you know Sylvain Wilford one of our very own uh, came from there Johan Gorkov a player that we were linked with how many times Yanam Via another player we were linked with constantly Musa So Decore now playing in the Premier League League Watford Usmane Dembele again another player Arsenal continue to be linked with and Jimmy Briand um, another one now the big talking point around this tie has been uh, the switching of the fixtures Initially, Arsenal were drawn at home in the first leg. There was this big thing about us kicking off at six o'clock, um, you know, and, and I'm not a fan of that. I must admit it makes it difficult for me to get there from work as well. Uh, but UEFA then switched the tie, supposedly. I understand that Wren have now uh, appealed that and they want to get it switched back the other way. From a Wren point of view, though, it's not fair for them, is it? Because they've been drawn a one away first, which they would have preferred. And all of, all of them, UEFA are saying... Actually, we're going to do it the other way around. It's not fair, is it? You can understand their grievance. No, it, it seems a bit ridiculous, all this, Harry. And especially, wasn't there a bit of an, an appeal as well uh, a couple of days before our last Europa League clash to get to get the, the time change? So, yeah, I think that came from the AST, didn't it? The yeah. Arsenal Supports Trust. Not sure they're going to make UEFA budge, but no. worth a try. But UEFA and all the... like, It's, it's not just UEFA. It's the, it's the Premier League. It's... All the TV companies, the fact you have to have three, you know, different um, subscriptions to be able to see the game. You know, like some of the games uh, that that are on in the FA Cup, it's not just Saturday at 3 o'clock anymore. There's some teams playing it on Friday night. There's a Sunday at 6 o'clock. I, m- I remember it was uh, Chelsea and m- one of the Sheffield clubs, right? The Sheffield club were the fans were going to have to come all the way from Sheffield to London and then back. And there was no trains after 6 p.m. So they, there's no way for them to get home. I mean, all the scheduling and stuff is ridiculous, but that's just part of modern football now, isn't it? Yeah, that, that's right. That's right. Um, there is a side story to this this clash, though, isn't there? Unai Emery famously fell out with Hatton Ben Arthur. Um, they had a massive falling out. Unai Emery questioned his consistency. Um, and after that game that I, I've spoken about a few times this season where PSG threw away a massive lead, didn't they, at the new Camp? I think they can can see three goals in six minutes. Oh, what a game that and was. And crashed out. Um, Hatton Ben Arthur famously after that came out and said that Unai Emery would never win the Champions League, no matter 
how good his side was or what team he had, even if he had the best team in the world. In fact, he didn't even say he'll never win the Champions League. He said he'll never get past the quarterfinals. Strong statements, isn't it? And yeah. uh, obviously, Ben Arfa and him don't get on. Everybody knows about it. There's talk that Ben Arfa used to go around the dressing room doing impressions of Emery trying to speak French um, when his back was turned. Emery... That's just mean. I know. Emery retaliated, called him selfish, told him to stop acting as though he's Lionel Messi. Um, and there's there's all sorts of bad feeling there. Uh, we spoke to Roman Molina actually on last week's podcast, Unai Emery's uh, biographer, and he touched on that falling out as well. So if you haven't listened to last week's show, do head over there and check it out. Uh, it is worth your time. Um, but yeah, I mean, and a lot of a lot of people use that as an example of Unai Emery's inability to handle big egos, and they've been sort of applying that to the Mesut Ozil situation. But Mesut Ozil doesn't strike you as the type of player to do something like that, does he? No, nah, he's not got an ego at all. And there was a lot of talk, as you said. I remember, remember the press after that um, that game uh, where I think Emery dropped Ben Arthur or he was you know, sent to the, the, the youth academy or wherever it was. And you definitely ostracise him. Uh, they, they were just saying you know, Emery's kind of lost the plot. And he didn't really do that well at, P- at PSG, Harry. Let's be, I think it was a big step up for him, wasn't it? And he wasn't quite ready. Like, managing players like Neymar is a difficult task. I mean, not a lot of managers can do it. And the fact that, you know, you really have to battle with him um, because he wants to be the star. Emery wasn't wasn't down for that. I think the the situation with Ozil was different. Ozil was a different character. He's quite... Um, like quiet and laid back, isn't he? I don't think he's the kind of player that wants to be in control of it, of the dressing room or control of anything. I just think with us, it was just a matter of him just not fitting the manager's play. And the manager said, "I don't care how much money you're on, uh, you know, I don't care how much of uh, a good player many people think you are. You don't fit into my team, so you don't play." And th- that's fair enough. And I do admire, you know, his his dedication to his own philosophy. But it does come to a point, as I was saying earlier, where you need to just see how it benefits the team. I mean, if if you're watching Arsenal over the last um, couple of months, you would say there's just a lack of creativity, isn't there? Absolutely. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Earlier on uh, this evening, I caught up with former Arsenal midfielder David Hillier. So stay tuned. We're going to take a quick break. And when we return, we'll be hearing from the former Arsenal man. Welcome back to the show, Mr. David Hillier. How have you been, mate? It's been a while. Yeah, yeah, been good, thanks. Um, been, you know, I haven't been doing too many Arsenal games. I've not seen a lot of the football, but um, been to the couple of the recent ones, seen Barté and uh, Southampton. So, yeah, enjoying myself and, and enjoying Arsenal creeping up into the fourth position in the league. That's right. That's what it's all about. That's the goal, isn't it, this season? And, uh, you know, if you had said to us at the beginning of the season that we'd be in this position, I'm sure most of us would have would have taken it. So, uh, not- well, I, I think I think I did mention it on on possibly on one of the previous podcasts that you know I'd see Arsenal really fighting for fifth or sixth, not really competing for fourth. But with the with the hiccups from teams around us, we've we've nipped in there, and um, it's about you know getting a foothold and staying in there. That's right. I mean, by hook or by crook, it doesn't really matter, does it? As long as we get there, uh, and that and that is key for the the development of this side. The funds that being in the Champions League bring obviously help, and we know that. The club are not well. My opinion is anyway that the club are not going to splash out big money until that happens. Again. No, so no. And I, I, also, I also think, from a player's point of view, who's looking at you know a top player who's possibly looking to move to a club, Champions League football is top of their list. They want to be playing in that that level. Um, so so you will draw the better players as well, and that will help um, Unai to sort of you know, strengthen his side with the players that he actually wants rather than the ones that are available. That's right. That's right. Absolutely. David, you said you were at the Southampton game. What did you make of the overall performance? It was a lot more positive than we've seen of late. Do you not think? Yeah, I thought it was a, a really tidy, um, comfortable, um, a, a concise performance. They looked like there was good communication across the back line uh, most of the time. Still a couple of little hiccups. You know, it does worry me when a straight ball over the top and Redmond is possibly in that we haven't ironed out those little um, mistakes, but I thought on the whole, pretty good defensively, and, and had a nice push going forward. Created a lot of chances. I mean, Lacazette could have bagged a few, couldn't he? Um, and even Oba when he come on, you know, we could be guilty of trying to walk the ball into the net. But against the side in the bottom three who were fighting, I thought I thought it was a really good performance. Yeah. 
Yeah, certainly, particularly in the first half, wasn't it? He dropped off a little bit in the second half, but that's yeah. kind of understandable, isn't it? I mean, you want to be a little bit cautious. You don't really want to throw points away unnecessarily by being too gung-ho, no. and, and I think that's that's actually a good thing, to be honest. That, that's right, and I think I was I was a little bit disappointed with Southampton in the second half because they came out, they restructured, you know, made a couple of changes, um, House and Hootel, and, and it did make a difference to his side. They had a better shape about them, and I thought, here we go, they're going to start fighting, and they're going to really start pressing, and, and if they do that, they're going to make a game of it, but they didn't, so Arsenal just, it was almost like a, a boxer keeping someone at arm's length, and he'd already won enough um, rounds to win the match, but, you know, he didn't really want to get hit, and he was just we were just keeping them at bay, so I think they sort of, they added to a more subdued second half, and Arsenal just, you know, did what they had to do. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, a lot of talk has, has been going on lately about the midfield and, and you're, you're a former midfielder, so there's no one better to ask than you. Um, we've been talking about it on previous shows. We've been talking about the whole Ozil thing, which we'll come on to in a little bit. But first of all, I want to get your thoughts on the sort of midfield pivot that sits in front of our back four. Um, you know, Granite Xhaka has been selected when he's fit pretty much every time. Uh, Unai right. Emery obviously likes him. And then you've had Matteo Guendouzi coming in and it's kind of been him and Torreira sort of swapping places here and there. For me, earlier on in the season, the Xhaka Torreira combination was working well. Couldn't really understand why Emery wanted to break that up. But if it was up to you, what would be that pairing and, and, and why? Well, I think I think the best pairing is Xhaka and Torreira at the moment. I haven't seen, you know, you've got Suarez to bring into the mix there. So, I don't know what he's really going to bring. Um, there was an opportunity, I thought, yesterday for him to get him on, but he, the manager decided otherwise. And we'll, we'll see Dennis, obviously, in, in the future come into the side. But if you're talking about players that have been playing there in recent games, um, yeah, Torreira and Xhaka. I think Torreira's come in, and what he's done is he's took a little bit of the responsibility off of Xhaka of receiving the ball in awkward positions. Um, Jack is not comfortable turning with his back to play in the middle of the pitch. So he, he drifts to the left a little bit. He gets it in that little pocket. And Torreira is good at getting the ball, turning, you know, and feeding into the front. So I think the balance of them two is good. And also, there's no pressure on Jacker to go forward anymore. So he's he just happy to sit in because yeah. he's more defensive minded. I think it, it suits those two better. Guendouzi, he's, a little, he's got a little bit of flair about him. I just think he needs to have the reins put on him and, you know, sometimes decision-making is, um, I wouldn't say erratic, but he, he, it's like, I want to play football all the time. You know, I want to go and win. I want to score a goal every time I get the ball. And it's not always about that. Yeah, um, It's about shape, cover, consistency, and he needs to learn those things. Yeah, I, um, I feel like he gets a little bit distracted sometimes by the ugly side of yeah. the game, the arguing with referees. And I feel like sometimes that takes away from what a good player he is. And I feel like there's no need to always get involved in those sort of things. I don't know if you agree. Yeah, I think that's because and it, it, it sits alongside exactly what I've just said, because he's playing at such an intense level all the time. You know, the intensity and the emotion that he's playing with is great, but you need to curtail it sometimes. And that comes out in, like you said, when he argues, when he gets pulled to the ground all the time and he's, you know, complaining about this and that, and then it will also affect your decision-making. You know, you'll want to do the best you can every time you've got the ball. That's not always the way. You need just to be calm and be reading the situations and playing the game that other players are playing around you as well. You don't want to start playing your own game. Um, and that worries me sometimes if he does start doing that, but he'll get that with experience, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure you're right. And, and David, the last time we spoke, this whole Ozil thing hadn't become a thing yet. Um, it was a non-issue. It wasn't a problem at the start of the mm -hmm. season so much. You know, he was dropped a few times and there was injuries, the back problems that we always hear about, the sickness. But since we last spoke, the whole Emery Ozil thing has become a bit of a, a talking point. Um, it was nice to see him back in the side against Borisov. It was nice to see him uh, back on the pitch again on Sunday, from my perspective anyway. What do you make of it? Well, how have you sort of seen this thing and, and where do you stand on it? Does Ozil warrant a place in Arsenal starting eleven from week to week? I, I don't understand how the situation's got to this stage. Um, first of all, you know, I'll say that... The, Mesut Ozil, if you, if you are privy to some of the, the videos and the training ground stuff that I see, the way he is with the lads and the way um, he conducts himself around the club, you know, it, it's like this 
none of this is happening to him. You know, and he's he's really happy, and all the players are happy with him, and the, the staff and the managers, and everyone's happy with him. And I don't think I don't think there's an issue with Mezet's game. I, I think the issue is, like you said, a, a little while ago it wasn't, you know, a thing. But when he's left out of the side so many times, he then starts to lose his consistent level he was playing at. So every time he comes back into the side, like um, coming back into the side yesterday, when he whenever he gets on the pitch, he's expected to do something so special to warrant a place in the side the next game. He's not got that. Um, he can't say, oh, well, I've, I've played the last 12 games. I've, I've had eight good free average and one bad. He hasn't got that in the locker, so he's putting yeah. himself under pressure every time. And it's not just him putting himself under pressure. The crowd are putting him under pressure. The manager, his players around him, all inadvertently, you know, because they want him to do so well. And it's difficult. If And, I mean, I asked you to, you know, let me know what you were going to ask me on the show tonight, didn't I? And you said, what would he be in the side if you was managing it? Yeah. And, and he, he would. But he'd have been in the side from the beginning and all through his bad games, I'd have carried on with him and I'd have I'd have made him consistent. And I don't want, you know, I wouldn't have made him into a, you've got to be a nine or a 10 every game or you ain't playing. I'd have been happy with a seven because a Mesut Ozil at seven is is another player at nine or 10. Um, so I think it's the situation has just developed into this thing now and it's put a lot of pressure on him. Yeah, absolutely. And I think for me, with Mesut Ozil, People talk about him coming off the bench and having an impact in games and maybe not. A lot of what Mesut Ozil does is that he grinds defences down because he gets the ball, he moves it on, he gets it back, he moves it to the other side. And it's the the fluency that we play with as a result that grinds defensive downs. It's not uh, defences down, sorry. It's not necessarily a blockbuster moment. It's more of what he does over a period of time. Would you agree with that? Well, I'd say that he does something a lot of the time you don't see some of the stuff he does. You don't appreciate it because you just think, oh, everybody should be playing that continuity stuff. But yes, he is. He does move people around. He does work defences. I think everybody's issue with Mesut Ozil is if you're so good when you're on the ball and you do these little things, why don't you do that all the time? And you can't do that. It's not possible. Um, So he plays the game that he he knows. Um, And... When he's when he's on form, he's the best player ever. But when he's just a little bit below form, he might as well be. You might as well drag him off because people are going to not going to give him the credit he deserves for all of that work that goes on behind the scenes, grinding sides down, like you said. And when he gets on the ball and he's looking to pick a pass, he can draw three players to him. Okay, if that pass doesn't make it, the thing is, he's questioning defenders all the time. He, he unsettles defenses just by being around them. And there's value in that for me. Yeah, but he's got, to, but he's got to have a playing level, and I think his playing level, because of going back to what we said about his consistency and not being picked, I think his playing level's dropped, to, and it's really difficult for him at the moment. Yeah, some great points there. Some great points, and fantastic to get some insight for someone who's played in the midfield for Arsenal. It's, you know, you... I haven't played like Mesut Ozil. I never <laughs> played up there. That was nosebleed territory. I didn't go up there into the pitch, but you know, there was. You understand that when you play with players in your team, like um, marquee players, if you like, uh, you know, power players, sometimes you need to play their game a little bit to get the yeah. best out of them. That's right. And maybe the manager, I don't know, maybe he's decided he, he ain't his power player and he don't need a power player in that system so he can afford not to play him every week. And that may well be the case. And I'm, I can't say it's not working because Arsenal are in full position. So, you know, I'm, I'm certainly not going to discredit the, the sides that the, the players that the manager's picking. Yeah. Um, as I said, fourth position, over the moon at that right now. And with a couple of big games coming up, Tottenham, Manchester United, we could see things change. And, you know, with the developments at Chelsea, you, ne- you never know what's going to go on. That's right. That's right. That's the great thing about the Premier League, isn't it? It's so unpredictable. Another player who I want to ask you about is Socrates. Now, mm-hmm. when he was signed, and, and I'm from a Greek background, so when he was signed, I knew more about him than most did, in the sense that I'd watched him play for the national team quite a lot. I'd never yeah. been overly impressed with him. I always thought he looked a bit sluggish. I always thought that he was not particularly gifted technically. And I had my reservations about the signing. I felt like, and I said it at the start of the season, that we were kind of shopping in the second bracket of players. And 
he's come in and I'm not saying that he's turned world class overnight, but what he has done is he's had an impact, hasn't he? How would you assess sort of his Arsenal career so far? Have you been impressed with him? It's difficult when you come into a leaky defence as a central defender. It must be, you know, and and a defence that was making um, errors, fundamental errors at times. And you're coming in under, again, under a bit of pressure. But to add to that, the guy that you're supposed to be playing with, or one of the guys that you're supposed to be playing with, then gets injured and spends the next however long portion of the season out, talking about Koscielny, then, you know, you know you've got to step up straight away from week one, basically. He had to since he was here. Uh, I think he's done brilliant. I think he is solid. And he is all those things you said. He's a little bit below the technical level of some of, of the, the Van Dykes, if you like. Yeah. Um, but the consistency of him, like I said about someone operating at a seven, you'd rather have a seven every week than a nine, than a five, than a nine, than a five, especially from a defender. Yeah. And that's what he gives you. And and he he makes a couple of mistakes and he's not the quickest, but he can react quickly and most of the time he makes the right decisions. So, you know, I think in the whole scheme of things, he's been a very, very uh, good signing for the club. Yeah, I'd agree with all of that. And I'd say streetwise, would you say that's a good word? Yeah, he knows how to play the game. He knows how to play the game. He don't, he don't, he don't get involved in anything, which is good. He never gets any involved in any shenanigans. Um, but he's quite happy to leave a bit on somebody. He's quite happy to, shall we say, make a professional um, foul and take a booking if he needed to. He, he understands, you know. Um, and and for me, if you look at statistically, I ain't got his exact numbers with me, but I know I did it um, earlier on in the season. He was, uh, Mustafi was way ahead in, in mistakes that meet, lead directly to a goal. Yeah. And he, he, to my mind hasn't made any direct mistakes with the ball that have led to a goal. Um, so from that point of view, he's, all those passes don't always go to the right person. They're not going to the worst person where you're getting a goal <laughs> scored against you. Um, you know, they're not critical errors. So he's, 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 done, he's done well for me. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I mean, looking at the rest of the team and, and we saw uh, during the Southampton game, Emery opted to leave Aubameyang out and he went with Lacazette up top and he kind of mm-hmm. went back to the way he was playing at the start of the season, wasn't he? When he was reluctant to start the two of them together, he said that it affected the balance of the team. Do you think that the team looks more balanced with one of them left out? Because for me, it's just such a difficult thing. You've got two great players there, but are we sort of affecting the team by trying to shoehorn the pair into the side at the same time? What's your view on that? Yeah, I do get what you're saying. I mean, everybody wanted that dream partnership, didn't they? But he held off for quite a few games at the start of the season, the manager, and then he put them together and it kind of worked. But it was still the games you remember are when Overs come on and made an impact because Lack has been terrorising them for most of the game. Alex Iwobi has been wearing them down on the left wing. And then all of a sudden, Ober comes on like he did um, yesterday. And he had loads of space, didn't he? How much space yeah. did he have? And you've got, you've got to credit Alex for that. Alex worked his socks off, um, you know, and, and, and tirely, tirelessly working the full back. So that in the end, when Ober comes on, you're thinking, I ain't got quite a pace to deal with him, so I'm going to have to drop off. So he makes the space for him. And then it, it did have an impact when he come on. Um, so my vote, I would have to say, looking at it statistically and logically, that probably only one of them on the pitch From starting the start. and, yeah. and introduce them together when the spaces open up. And especially in a system he wants to play. Yesterday we saw Ramsey making all the runs past Lacazette early doors. And there were some good runs there. Um, you can't play that system with two of, two of them up there doing the same thing. It, it don't work. And Ober's a little bit lost on the wing sometimes um, until he gets that through ball that he can run onto. Yeah. No, I agree. I, I think there's certainly an argument for that. I think it'll be interesting to see what Emery does, whether he'll go back to the way he started the season um, after a little bit of a turbulent period in the middle of the season, it has to be said, mm-hmm. the performances dropped off, the results dropped off a little bit, but hopefully, you know, he might go back to, to what he started with and we might see, uh, you know, us finish the season strongly. And that's what we all want. We're all Arsenal fans at the end of the day. Um, now, in the last few shows, particularly over the last few months, I've been quite critical of Unai Emery. Um, 
and not because I, I want him sacked or anything like that. Just there's been some decisions that I found strange and I've not been able to get my head around them. How would you assess his tenure so far? Because I know last time we spoke, it was right near the beginning of the season. Probably had a bit more time now to look at him and judge him and his team selections and his decisions. How would you say he's he's done so far? And, and can you see him being a solution for Arsenal for the next three, four seasons? I think certainly he he can be a solution for Arsenal for the next for more than three or four seasons. If he wins something in the next two, then you know, and Arsenal historically don't get rid of their managers willy nilly. And if he if he does win something and he, he gets I think if he gets the signings he wants, um, and gets the support that he wants, then I I think he's a great manager for Arsenal. If he doesn't, it's not and it's as simple as that in, in everybody else's terms as well, because he, he will um, if you don't get the results and Arsenal fall off, then you know the, there are consequences to that. Personally, though, my opinion of him is he's a good manager. He's he's animated. He's passionate. He, he's got the team right at the forefront. He's not interested in club stuff. You know, honestly, take it from me. On the inside, he don't care what happens at the club. He's he is only worried about the football. When Arsene Wenger was there, players it was like, oh, you can't approach players, get autographs because they've got to be fully focused on the game. He ain't worried about that. He lets players come and do interviews and he says, you know, you've got to be relaxed. You've got to be playing your best game. Um, and I just think that dynamic is great, what he's putting into the side. But yeah. there's still a lot more to come. I would like, I would personally like a statement from him. It would never happen because the club would never allow it to say what his, plan, what his personal plan is long term to say I'm looking in the next four windows to get two players in this position two in that one my target for um, 2019-2020 will be definitely be a top four finish looking for top two really this far in this cup that far in that cup you know I, I want a sort of breakdown of, of what's going on yeah the club the club would never give you that though, no would they? of course of course not <laughs> um the club would never give you that. So I've got, I've got to work with, as an Arsenal fan, I've got to work with Unai Emery, believe in him and hope that the transfer windows bring him what he wants to do, what he wants to do with Arsenal Football Club. And I think then we'll see the best from him. Yeah, I agree. And and that's been my kind of thing that I've been picking on him a little bit about is that I've struggled at times to see the vision that the system's changed so many mm. times. And it's kind of like, well, if you want to play one way, stick to it and implement it rather than chopping and changing. And and that's kind of been my thing with Emery so far. But I think you're right. It would be nice to know yeah. how far he thinks he can take this team. Or, or he could simply come out and say, look, I'm chopping and changing and doing this and doing that because I'm looking at this player for that. I'm looking at and, and give you a reason why he's doing yeah. it. Not just, not just, oh, uh, and it's difficult because of his language as well. He just, you know, the player I picked is the player for the game today. I like yeah, yeah. I picked player from training, and in my mind, he plays game. That ain't no, that ain't that. Don't tell me nothing. Yeah, that's right. You know, I, I want him to say, look, at the moment, maybe Meza Özil, he can't fit into the system I want to play. I want to play someone who makes runs into these areas, and that's not Mesut's game. And I don't want to, I don't want to forfeit everybody else in the team to fit Meza Özil in. If he tells me that. Then I say, fine, what yeah. are you going to do? You're going to put in there and let me see if that works. And I'm happy with that. But because we don't get that feedback, we question him. Like, you, like you're saying, you question him. But I don't think he can do that because he, he works for Arsenal Football Club and he's, he's, got a, he's got to toe the line. You know what I mean with Arsenal? You don't. Yeah. There's a certain level of, of respect for the club and everything's kept in-house. So they'll be quietly working behind the scenes but we won't know anything about it until the day it happens yeah no, I totally agree David been an absolute pleasure talking to you before I let you go though are you going to give us a prediction for Bournemouth on Wednesday night and uh, the North London derby at the weekend well North London derby is easy isn't it I hope we get a draw <laughs> I hope we get a draw <laughs> um, I did you know what I just hope we go out and play really well and, and play like it's a North London derby and obviously obviously I want us to win um, results wise if I was a betting man I would bet on Tottenham to win the game I'll tell you that straight if I was a gambler but I'm not I'm an optimist so Arsenal are going to win 2-1 and <laughs> Bournemouth Bournemouth is going to be it's going to be a tough game but um, we, we, we've got great history at Bournemouth um, we, 
they play our kind of football, so it'll be a nice game. And um, I think that'll be another another similar result to Southampton, two or three nil. Brilliant, brilliant stuff. David, do you want to let our listeners know how they can follow you on social media? Well, I'm on um, only really on Twitter. I am on Instagram as well, um, but I don't know the my handle or whatever. <laughs> You call it. I'm not really down with the kids on that one, but it's just uh, at Dave Hillier with two R's on Twitter. Brilliant. And I'll make sure it's included in the description of this episode. For those of you who want to follow David, do head over there. Do give him a follow. Um, it's not every day we find uh, ex-Arsenal players that are willing to chat to us and, and talk all football with us. And for, for that, I thank David um, very much. And hopefully we can speak again in the near future, David. Absolutely. Yeah, look forward to it after, after the North London victory. Definitely. <laughs> lovely stuff. Cheers, David. All right. Lovely. On Sunday morning, I had the pleasure of talking to the chief sports writer over at The Independent, Jonathan Liu, and we touched on a fantastic piece that he wrote on the Arsenal just last week. We're going to take another short break, and when I return, you'll be able to hear that interview. Welcome to the Chronicles of Aguna. Jonathan Liu, how are you doing, my friend? Uh, I'm great. Thank you for having me on. No problem. The pleasure is ours, my friend. Uh, and sorry to get you up on this uh, early Sunday morning. Uh, we are recording ahead of Arsenal's clash with Southampton. Um, so Jonathan's kindly woken up early on a Sunday. So we really do appreciate it, mate. And uh, let's get your thoughts on, on all things Arsenal. Now, you did put out an article the other day um, on the Independence website, which was titled joyless and bloodless Stan Kroenke's Arsenal has lost sight of its basic purpose now for me this was a really really powerful piece I saw it shared uh, on social media by a few people that I follow and I thought I'll have a read on my lunch break and I had a read and there was so much in there to relate to I mean what inspired you to, to write this sort of piece and for those of you listening we will be leaving a link to it in the description of this episode um, yeah, well, well, thanks very much. First of all, um, I suppose the first thing to say is I, I'm not I'm not personally an Arsenal fan, but I am surrounded in my life by by people who who are. And I suppose this piece was kind of the the distillation of these people for the last few months, very slowly having the life drained out of them and moaning about it. Um, so I, I, I suppose that, that that was the genesis of it trying to distill just just what it is about Arsenal it's, it's kind of it's not it's not as though it's not as though people are complaining about results although people are slightly complaining about results it's not as though people are complaining about the style of football although partly that is what people are doing it, it's almost as if there's a certain numbness it's that, that, that set in and um, that, that was kind of what I was trying to get over that people are sort of less less invested in the club as, as an idea and I think that, that's so important to a football club it's got to stand for something and I think at the moment people aren't really sure what it stands for yeah and, and I think you're absolutely right in saying that I think going to the Emirates nowadays when you see sort of the drop in attendances I think that kind of backs up your point the fact that there's so many season ticket holders that still stay away even after Arsene Wenger's left you know before that people were saying oh these guys will come back when Arsene uh, leaves, but that hasn't really been the case. Again, the attendances this season have been poor, and I'm not talking about some uh, about the Barte Borisov game. Sorry, the other night because it was a 6 p.m. kickoff, and that's understandable to a degree. Uh, you know, when certain people can't make it, but the attendances have certainly dropped at Arsenal, and, and I think you're right. I think a lot of people have not lost interest, but they've lost their buzz for it. I think, and and it's a real shame. I mean, Jonathan, in terms of Unai Emery's tenure so far, what have you made of it? Because I think the Arsenal fan base are quite split at the moment. I've been quite vocal on this show in recent weeks as to say that I don't feel he's the man for this job in the long term. That's not to say I want him sacked or I'm not going to back him now, but I don't think he's the long term solution. What are your thoughts on his tenure so far? And, and do you agree or disagree with me? I I think he's, he's done better than I thought he would. Um, he's, I mean, you talk about long-term solutions. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure there are long-term solutions in, in the, the job market these days. The way that super clubs are run uh, are, you know, and certainly the, the way that the Arsenal seem to be run at the moment is that it's it's almost it's almost, it's almost run in two or three year cycles because that's that's pretty much as far ahead as, as you can plan. Uh, I think you'll, you know, I, I think this is, you know a cliche but it's a it's a transitional season for the club and it could clearly have gone quite a lot worse there's 
some talent in the squad, but it's not it's not you know a squad packed with with names that that you would expect to go and challenge for a title or, or expect to you know to, to to be playing on on the big stages consistently. It's 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 quite an unbalanced squad, um, and so what he's what he's done with it, although it, you know it hasn't been intelligible at times what he's trying to do with them he's managed to keep the show afloat in a way that maybe uh Moyes at Manchester United didn't do yeah. there's there's still a, there's still a kind of a club there for the next guy to 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 pick up if, if that makes any sense um and so that's what I think he's that's what I think he's done I think that's kind of what he's what he was hired for uh I don't think a lot I don't think a lot of people were, were that infused by him compared to some of the some of the other names that have been bandied around certainly the last few years uh and I think his job has been just to basically keep the show on the road. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with that. I think, uh, you know, I've always said that I feel he was kind of a stopgap appointment. He was someone mm. that was willing to come in and work the way the club wanted him to work. Um, you know, in the sense that, you know, the the, the transfer funds will be limited. The, the shots will be called by a director of football or a head of recruitment. But for me, I think the disappointing thing is that the people that hired Unai Emery that were so enthused about him, the Ivan Gazidis and Sven Mislintats of this world who put a lot of effort in making sure that Unai Emery got the job have now left. And I don't know what you think, but I think that perhaps since they've gone, there's been a bit of a change in direction and maybe Arsenal don't fully trust Unai Emery could that be why the transfer funds were so limited in January and we didn't end up going and getting anyone in permanently yeah I mean if you if you think about the shelf life of a, of a manager these days if you, get, if you get two years at a club you've done you've done all right and so when you come to the January when, when a player comes to 18 months until the end of their contract that's kind of like it's almost a bit of a wake up for you think, all right now now is time now is the time for a pretty brutal and frank assessment of you know what this player's future is and and managers are kind of always going through that process uh and even what is it you know six months into the job there you know there are question marks uh the fans aren't, aren't totally uh, haven't totally bought into it um you know the the, the squad hasn't been you know, it hasn't been performing for that at its you know at its full potential for, for like a few months so yeah, it's kind of natural that the questions are getting asked, and I think that, I mean, it's it's hard to know what what the likes of Cronky are thinking. Yeah, I, absolutely. Such is the such is the kind of the, I don't know. There's there's a, there's, there's a sort of a vacuum at boardroom level that, and and it's it's hard to know. I mean, you talk about you talk about direction, and it's hard really to know where, what direction Arsenal are facing at the moment. That, that I think that's the main problem, and that's contributed to this, to this climate of you know, uncertainty and, and, and sort of dis- displacement that, um, that has, has kind of created the, the, the apathy that I, that I wrote about. Yeah, I mean, looking at obviously the squad and, and you, we've spoken already about an unbalanced squad and the fact that perhaps Unai Emery was brought in just to kind of tick things over. If bearing in mind, you know, the, the position that we're in, we're a point outside of the top four, um, you know, assuming that obviously we beat Southampton and all that and things continue to go well. And we've got Bournemouth coming up on Wednesday uh, at home, another game that we should, in theory, win. If Unai Emery was to make the top four this season, that would be an overachievement, though, wouldn't it, given this this current group that he's got to work with and the competition, of course? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you if you imagine that we've got, in my opinion, two of the, the great Premier League sides of the, of the 21st century, challenging for the title at the moment, you know, We've got uh, Pochettino, Spurs. Um, we've got you know United, sort of revived under Solskjaer, and and Chelsea, which for you know, despite the trough it sort of got into itself at the moment, there was a huge amount of optimism over Sarri and quite a bit of money behind it as well. To, to finish, if you know, if Arsenal can can somehow sneak through and finish fourth, that that certainly would be an overachievement, or even winning the Europa League and, and getting back in, in the Champions League that way, because it's certainly, you know, uh, it's certainly. A, an achievable target for them this season. It should be an achievable target for them this season. I mean, Ren are a decent side, but there, there's no kind of Atletico Madrid in the draw to be that, that you, you get you get daunted by. So there's there's still a huge amount to be salvaged this season, and the the way that seasons end, I think, is is so so important to the mentality of the club 
going into the summer and then going into the next season. I mean, the, the, the great example of this is Leicester, sort of surviving, surviving relegation in 2015, and it, and it then provides an impetus. If Arsenal go on a little run, I mean, April, May, just sneak into the top four places, the mood around the place will change, and, and that, that can be the fuel for something, something big in the future. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Totally agree with, with with all of your points there, Jonathan. It's fantastic getting some insight uh, from someone in the in the media business like yourself and someone so prominent in that in that industry too. So, uh, Jonathan, I really, really appreciate you taking the time out to speak to me today. Um, honestly, I can't thank you enough. Do you want to let our listeners know how they can follow you on social media and keep up with your your latest work? Nah, you're you're all right. <laughs> that's a bit of peace and quiet to be honest <laughs> <laughs> no worries <laughs> no worries <laughs> but thanks for having me on and um, you know to, to, to you know followers of, of English football and, and followers of Arsenal around the world um, you know thanks the pleasure is ours. Like I said, right at the top of this interview, the pleasure is ours. And like I said, having someone, you know, as knowledgeable as yourself come on the show and, and take time out to come on the show means the world to me. And I, and I really, really do appreciate it. And I'm sure our listeners do too. I appreciate that. Cheers. Right. We've, we've got to that part in the show where it's time to answer your questions. A huge thank you to every single one of you who's reached out via social media and provided us with a question for this week's show. Unfortunately, I won't have time to get through all of them, but we're going to pick a select few and get Mike's and my thoughts on those. So let's start off uh, with this question that comes from Mr. DJ at expat Guna on Twitter. He's a, uh, a massive follower of the show. Uh, always gives us a match day shout out and a Friday podcast follow. So massive thanks to, to Mr. DJ. Now, his question is not Arsenal related, but it's something that we feel is worth discussing. Uh, the Kepa situation, Chelsea's goalkeeper, um, the world's most expensive goalkeeper, actually, um, disobeyed Maurizio Sarri's orders to come off. Uh, during the Carabao Cup final, he says that he was trying to um, notify the bench that he was okay to carry on. Sorry, since come out and said it was a massive misunderstanding. Do you think Sorry thinks that, or do you think Sorry's trying to protect himself? Because Chelsea have spent a lot of money on this keeper, and they'd probably pick him over Maurizio Sarri at the moment. So, Mr. DJ's question is, who has been undermined, and uh, you know? Who's in the wrong? Who's in the right? Basically, I think it's just complete spin, Harry. You'd probably agree with that. I mean, Sarri's had to go into that um, press conference and be very, very diplomatic. Kepa's also come out and saying there's a misunderstanding. I don't think there's a misunderstanding at all. <laughs> Sarri said to him, "Look, you've pulled up twice. Come off." And Kepa said, "No." And to actually disrespect your manager like that, I've never seen anything like it. I was sitting there and it went on for for a couple of minutes, didn't it? And uh, I was just in shock. I was like. Look, your manager just called you off. Go off the pitch, and it was—it just so happened, didn't it, that uh, he actually made a mistake in the shootout, which probably Caballero, who's a bit of a penalty specialist, would have saved. It was just disgusting, to be honest. And you know, when uh, when Sari was on, on the touchline and going mental, he kind of like made his way, way towards the uh, t- towards the the changer. I was like, is that it? Is he walking out? It was out? as if he was walking out. Because the commentator out. goes as well. Is this is this Maurizio Sari leaving the jo- leaving the Chelsea job? I know he's come under a lot of stick. He's an, another one is similar to to Emery, but not quite so. He's so so rigid in his in his play. But um, to actually disrespect a manager like that, I think Kepa. If if I was sorry, well, first of all, I would have dragged him off. I would have said, look, like just just come. I would have actually gone onto the pitch. I'm not gonna. Lie. If I was a manager, it's disgusting. Um, but secondly, I would I would drop him. I would say, look, you've disrespected me as as a manager. And you know that that can't happen. It's just a ma- it's a it's player power, isn't it? That's you it. can't be giving them that. That's exactly what it is, player power. And I think that's something that can have a real impact on Chelsea's season going forward. That, like you said, the level of disrespect to clearly disobey your manager in front of a stadium of eighty thousand people on the biggest stage in a cup final is just it's unbelievable. I can't believe that he's got away with it. Um, I understand why Sarri's dealt with it the way he has. I feel as though, like I said when I was asking you the question, because of the amount that Chelsea have invested on this player, I think Sarri's job is in doubt anyway, um, given that the season hasn't gone as well as they would have liked so far anyway. Um, And I think that this would have been another 
mark against his name as far as Roman Abramovich is concerned. So I think he's had to come out and try and defuse the situation as quickly as possible. Uh, but yeah, like you said, the level, level of disrespect, they're unbelievable. And I can't believe that he's just going to be allowed to get away with that. I find it Yeah, I mean, surely he won't. I mean, Chelsea are in a lot of trouble now. But a £70 million player, all right, I'll give you that he is young and inexperienced. And maybe if it was a bit more of an older player, he wouldn't necessarily do that. And I, I know, like, as a player, you probably, you, you, of course you want to stay on. And he was probably thinking, look, I was a bit injured, but I'll just, I'll just play on. Um, but you just can't. You can't, you can't, you can't do that. And, you know, I, I feel very sorry for Sari because I feel like it was just, the wrong uh, appointment. As a follower of, of the Serie A, Harry, you know he's a football romantic, isn't he? I mean, people are saying, oh, he's not won anything, but he transformed Napoli into, yeah. into title challengers. And I just think it's the wrong appointment for the wrong club. The club is probably one of the harshest in terms of managerial, you know, stay in power. So I think this, right. this move to Chelsea will have come as a real culture shock for Maurizio Sarri. Someone who's managed in Serie A, like you said, he's come from really nothing. Um, he, he took that Napoli team, he transformed them, made them into title contenders. And, and for the most part of last season, they were in with a real shot of, of taking the title from Juventus. Didn't quite come to fruition. The reputation he built doing that got him the job at Chelsea. And I guess from his point of view, he's probably feeling really disrespected. First by the English press, who I think have been extremely harsh on him. And secondly, to have that done by your own player, in that sort of circumstance, I think that could be the, the final nail in the coffin. Unfortunately, he's a manager that I like, actually. I don't want to see him sacked. Um, I'm quite pleased with the way Chelsea are performing as well. But other than that, you know, from a pure football fan's perspective, he's not someone that you want to see sacked for because his players are, are revolting in, in that way. Uh, another question comes from Marble Halls TV on Twitter. He asks, is Aubameyang under the weather lately? Or is it a matter of his deployment in the team? He seems a little lost as a winger. Um, we kind of touched on this earlier on. Aubameyang as a winger, it's not really ideal. Deal with it. No, I mean, as I was saying, it's square per open round holes, but you just can't leave out someone that's as lethal as he is. And that's I right. think really it does come down to just altering the system to, to get them both in. And I, I know I was saying earlier about uh, maybe 4 one 2 one 2 kind of system where... Um, you play them too, and then maybe Mesa Ozil in as a as a number ten. Uh, I just think it's about altering it, and as well al altering the system based on who you're playing. If, in terms of Aubameyang under the weather, I don't I don't know. I think that's just the kind of play he is. He's not really involved in the game, but he'll score you two goals because he's just in the right place at the right time. I think it does depend on service, and when you do push him out, like not forgetting that takes one of the wingers out. So any potential service that might come to him. Uh, is, uh, is is closed off. So, um, yeah, I think we need to try and uh, look at that situation. But as I was all saying, I wanted to ask you, Harry, as a, as a typical number nine, who do you think is better, Lacazette or, or Aubameyang? I think as a typical number nine, I think Lacazette brings a lot more to the team. I think his link-up plays a lot better. I think he, he spins defenders better. Um, he is more involved in the game, and I think he gives you a focal point to your attack. So for those reasons, I prefer Lacazette in that position. But you can't argue with a Bamiyang goal return. And that's the thing, isn't it? I think he scored 15 goals in the league this season. You can't argue with a player who brings you that sort of return. So, I mean... What do you say about... Let me let me uh, put you... Yes, say, all right, we're not playing Mesut Ozil, but we're still playing a 4 2 three, one. Is there any way that um, that Lacazette could play as like a, almost a second striker but behind a Bamiyang? Not for me. Um, not for me because I think Lacazette needs to be the spearhead of the attack. I can't see him playing any in the role because I think a lot of what he's been good at this season has been... I, th I think why Emery's enjoyed having him as the centre forward and, and he's perhaps chosen to move a Bamiyang out to the left rather than it be the other way around is for a number of reasons. There's the obvious reason that Aubameyang's known for having pace. He's a bit... When you look at him, you see a bit of that Thierry on remold. I'm not saying he's anywhere near as good, but you see that pacey, wide man and forward, if you know what I mean. Like he could beat players and, and things like that. Whereas Lacazette is, is not that type of player. But I think Lacazette has basically shown the rest of the team exactly what Unai Emery is trying to achieve with this high press. 
He presses people all the time. How many times this season have you seen the referee blow his whistle and award the foul against Lacazette because he's pressed too much? And I, I think Emery's been really impressed by his work rate. And I think in that position, that's what Emery wants to see. And so he just seems better suited to it to me. And uh, yeah, I'd pick Lacazette. But like you said... How can you leave out a guy that scored 15 Premier League goals this season? It's a good problem to have, I guess. Yeah, exactly. And we've been crying out for a striker for so long. And now it, it turns out we've got two, two fantastic ones. So, you know, I think, as you said, it's not a bad problem to have. Um, we can we can work with it. And to be honest, it's not really the worst thing in the world pushing uh, Bamiang out as a winger. Because ultimately, who are you dropping? Probably Alex Awobi. Um who actually I got a lot of stick on Twitter recently, Harry, because I suggested uh, when Bayern played Liverpool that we should have kept, held on to Serge Gnabry because what a player he's turned out to be. And I said he's so much better than, than it will be. I mean, that really was terrible business, wasn't it? Selling Serge Gnabry for £7 million to Bayern Munich. And now he's starting in the Champions League against Liverpool. I think we mismanaged Serge Gnabry when we sent him out on loan to West Brom, a team that he was never going to flourish at. And, and ultimately, we got that wrong because he's ended up at Bayern Munich. So that says it all, doesn't it? Um, this next question comes from Hus147. Thank you for your question, mate. Um, we've kind of already answered this, but I'm going to call it out anyway, um, just because you've gone to the trouble of sending it in. So thank you so much. He says, despite the call for playing both Aubameyang and Lacazette, do you agree that we've had a better structure, stroke balance in games this season when Lacazette starts up top and, and, and Aubameyang comes off the bench? think we kind of agree that we do have a better balance is, is that where you stand on it yeah I think more fluid because obviously he just works as a better uh, as a better center forward in, in terms of he's able to hold the ball up bring others into play so I think naturally uh, it's just better I think sometimes Harry when the two of them play together there's there has to be a link in, in between them because but both of them up front um, Bamiya doesn't really drop off so when when you have a Wobi, the the good thing that he does do he he drops off and he collects the ball and he carries it. But when when Abamian plays in that position, he doesn't necessarily do that. And the times where we've played Abamian Lacazette without an Urzel, we've really struggled for for creativity because someone like Gwendouzi, he's a fantastic young player, a box to box midfielder, but he's not going to unlock defenses. So I think yeah, definitely like more uh, fluid with Lacazette in the team. Yeah, I agree with that. And this final question comes from Joe1204, who says, how do you guys assess Arsenal's chances of going all the way in the Europa League, Mike? Um, I think we've got a decent tie against Wren. You know, uh, I think it's ninth uh, in, in Liga, uh, which is a very, not a very competitive league. So to be down there is not is not fantastic. Um, so once that is over, you know, we'll be through to, to the quarterfinals. Um, and... There's a lot of difficult teams, Harry. You know, and I would say the way that the draw is lined up uh, with most of the big teams getting, you know, relatively easy draws. Um, you got you got Sevilla, you got Valencia. I'd say the only team that hasn't got an easy draw is probably Inter, who drew who drew Frankfurt, one of the form teams in the Bundesliga. So w when you're looking at these teams uh, later on, they're, they're dangerous, especially like a Sevilla who have done well this season in in La Liga, and. Wouldn't it be kind of uh, magical if you had like a Sevilla Arsenal final? You know, in, in I Emery against the old club, he won three Europa Leagues with. But don't forget, there's still Chelsea in there as well. So I think the way it's shaped up, it's, it's going to be a difficult composition. I think from the quarters, we're going to have a tough team to play all the way to the final if we get there. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I agree with that. And that brings us to the end of another episode of the Chronicles of Aguna. My thanks to Mike Stavrou. Uh, my thanks to Jonathan Liu and, of course, former Arsenal midfielder, David Hillier for joining me on this week's show. If you don't already, hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, uh, leave us a review if you're listening on iTunes. It's ever so important to us. Uh, and don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Chronicles underscore AFC. We'll be, we'll be later on in the week with a preview show looking ahead to uh, the North London derby over at Wembley. I uh, almost said White Hart Lane there, but they don't have a stadium, do they? Um, <laughs> So, yeah, we'll be looking ahead no to cheese that. Room. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And on next week's show, when we review the North London derby, we'll be joined by former Arsenal striker Jeremy Aliadier. So that's one you won't want to miss. Until then, take care of yourselves and uh, up the Arsenal.